Holy name. Amen. I want to talk about discipleship this morning, and I'm conscious that I'm kind of preaching to the choir a bit, because you know as much about this as I do, if not more. Um, but it's what God put on my heart. Um, I'm also promoting a book. Uh, working with released prisoners. Now, I need to say a little bit about where that comes from. Um, I, I, after our experiences at Dovegate, it was my um, privilege with Simon Edwards, who we know, and one or two other people, Sandy was there too, um, to set up Walk Ministries, which um, we're familiar with Walk Ministries. Um, but what we saw was these hundreds of guys coming to Christ and lives genuinely being changed, really pe people's attitudes changing, their orientation changing, turning towards God, turning away from the lives that they had before. And we were linking them up with churches on the outside, and some of these churches had good social programs running, some of them were sending volunteers into the prison. They were, they were what you'd call good churches. And yet the, the traction of these guys in the churches really wasn't very good. And we saw many, many of them coming back to prison again. And it was, it was frustrating, it was, it was more than that, because some of these guys were desperate, they were angry, 
they were disillusioned, they were suicidal in some cases. Um, and so what comes out of a really important need that we were seeing among people who'd been released from prison? Um, and it's set up to be a bridge from people who were in custody to enable them to live a independent, profitable, satisfying life. And it's all about discipleship. This is about discipleship. And I think discipleship is something that we misunderstand. Um, we think it's to do with Bible studies. We think it's to do with teaching doctrine. We think it's to do with um, having a form of words and kind of joining a club. But it isn't anything like that at all. And I want to share some, some words from Scripture. Uh, we'll start with uh, Matthew 28, which we'll be familiar with, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel. But I also want to look at the way Jesus works with his disciples um, towards the beginning of Mark's Gospel. So let's uh, have a look at Matthew 28, uh, just the last few verses, verses 16 to 20. You'll be familiar with this. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came, it's quite important that some of them doubted. Bear in mind what I'm going to say a little bit later on. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, very familiar words, I guess. Um, I grew up in evangelical churches, and going to all the world was the thing. Um, and, and, and there is very much a, a, a missionary sense to this, that we're going to go into all the world, to the end of the earth. But if you read the parallel passage in Luke, it says beginning in Jerusalem. We start where we are. We start where we are. We start where our, where our feet are stuck in the mud and where we have to actually move out. And that's the bit that we forget sometimes. We think we've got to go somewhere in order to be a disciple, in order to make disciples. Uh, but we haven't. We've got to be, just be where we are. God's put us in this place. Our, our, our church membership, our worship, our membership of the body of Christ is an extension of our life, of where we live, of our home, of our family. And it's, that's an important thing. If you find yourself traveling 20, 30 miles to go to church, that's a problem. Sometimes God does do that for a reason, for a season, Possibly, you know, you, you need to hear a message or, or possibly there's a relationship that you need to form or something like that. But generally speaking, we should be worshipping members of the body of Christ where we live. I think that's a, a rule, actually. So, what, are the, what is this idea about making disciples? What, what, what does it mean to be a disciple? And what does it mean to make disciples? Because this seems to be the critical thing here. Right at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, first chapter, um, Mark 1, 15, I remember Mark, 1's, uh, uh, Mark 1, 15 was the uh, verse we used uh, in one of the missions, wasn't it? Now is the time. Uh, this is verse 17, a couple, of, a couple of verses further on. Jesus meets Simon Peter and Andrew beside the Sea of Galilee, and he calls them to follow him. He says, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. Now they're fishermen. And there they are with their boats and their nets. And Jesus meets them beside the sea, beside the lake, and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's his first calling. These men weren't going to become followers of Jesus only. They were, they were going to become followers of Jesus, but they were also going to be carrying out his work. They were disciples, but they were also disciplers. And that's the important thing. We know that we have to make disciples, but I think we miss that we need those, those disciples also need to be disciplers. They need to be 
fishers of men. They need to be following on this work. We are carrying on the work of Jesus and they will be carrying on the work of Jesus too. That's an important thing. So, how are we to make disciples? Does it mean that we're going to lead people to Christ and make converts? I'm sure there's an element of that. I was very conscious when we were doing missions in the prison. We did, we did evangelistic missions in the, in the category B prison. Now, this is highly, highly irregular. <laughs> very, very, uh, very unusual. And in fact, the first one we did, the senior chaplain was the imam. Um, and it all, it all took place across his desk. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a very, very unusual thing. You're not allowed to make converts in a prison. You're not allowed to do it. We'd have been banned from going in. Sandy would probably have been sacked. You know... <laughs> You're not allowed to do it. It's actually against the law, okay? So, and yet, that first mission we did a week, it was Sunday to Sunday, eight days, um, and we saw 15% of the prison come to Christ, 128 guys, something like that. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, just ma amazing. And, I, I, and I, I was thinking, I, I'm not sure that I believe in this. I'm not sure that this is going to happen. I'm not even sure. I was very tentative about it. I, I was really a voice of doubt. I was a Thomas at this stage. But we just saw God move. It was just, just like he opened the door to heaven. It was amazing. Fantastic. But we weren't allowed to preach. We weren't allowed to make, we weren't allowed to make converts, and yet... We saw 128 guys come to Christ. How did that happen? Well, so you got about 45% of the, of, of, of the prison who signed up as being members of the Church of England or, members, or, 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 or Roman Catholics. So, but they, didn't, they, never, they never showed up at church. They, they were never there in chapel. So the first thing to do was to get them to come and get them fired up, put a spiritual defibrillator across their chest and zap them into life, and then they go and tell their mates. They can, they can go and do it. It's nothing to stop them proselytizing. That's fine. So, so, and, that, and, and that's the thing. They were becoming disciples, but they were also becoming active disciples. They were bringing people to Christ. Simon tells a story. Of when he, he was at a very low point in his life, possibly the lowest point in his life. If you know Simon's a big guy, and at this point, I think it was about eight stone or something ridiculous. He was, he was, he, he was tiny. He was broken. He was too, suicidal. And he landed at Dovegate. And he landed in a cell with a guy called Darren, who you may also know. <laughs> you guys know him. <laughs> and Darren led him to Christ. Humbly. Just led him to Christ. Um, it's fantastic. And that, that journey continues. Darren's with us now at Walk. Um, a disciple is a student. Someone is learning or training. That's an important aspect. And a student or a trainee is under a discipline. They're accountable to the person who's training them. They're accountable to their tutor. They're accountable to their teacher, whoever it is. The goal of Jesus talking to Simon and Andrew by the sea, what he's trying to do here, right at the very beginning... Is to make them fishers of men. They're already fishermen. It's going to make them fishers of men. I don't think there's any such thing in biblical Christianity of being a passive disciple. The idea of somebody being in church and sitting on a, on a pew or in a seat and just coming along every Sunday, having a, an hour and a half or two hours of worshipping God and then going home again, I don't think that's a thing in Scripture. I don't see it. We are to be active disciple makers. Now we've all got our own gifts, we've all got our own talents. My friend and colleague Simon is a prolific evangelist. I was walking through Handley with him once and he met this guy sitting beside the street, he didn't know him. Simon knows most of the people he meets in Handley, it's, it's, it's astonishing really, but he didn't know this guy. But he led him to Christ beside the street, walked down to Handley Baptist Church, met Trevor, the pastor there, introduced him to the pastor, planted him in the church, discovered that he had a drink problem, and signed him up at Battelle, all within the space of about three quarters of an hour. 
he led him to Christ, planted him in a church, and was addressing it. <laughs> That's active discipleship. Now, my gifts, are, I, 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 I can't do that. I'm, I'm useless at leading people to Christ. But I, I've got other gifts. I'm a teacher. I teach. That's my thing. And I, 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 I write, too. <laughs> Build people in their faith and to expand that kingdom of God to make disciples. We must be disciple makers. If we're going to make disciples, we are bringing people under authority as students. That's a big deal. One of the problems that we had in the chaplaincy with all these people coming to Christ, sometimes they'd come in on a Thursday or something like this, and they'd be going out again the next Thursday, and you wouldn't, they, they, they'd come along and you'd get them, they'd come to Christ, they'd give their lives to the Lord, and then they'd go out again and never see them again. And that's a bit of a problem, because you just have to trust God that they're going to land somewhere on their feet spiritually, but you, we don't know. But that's quite an unusual situation. Usually, if you're leading people to Christ, you're going to be walking with them. You're going to be walking alongside them, hence the walk is called walk. We're walking alongside people every day we're there we're providing a structure around them so this is what walk does it takes people who are in a state of vulnerability who are very often broken um i mean we get around them we put a structure around them we put a framework around them quite a close framework the guys are on the farm, it's quite a close environment. It's a, it's a closed environment. It's, it's quite tough in, t in, in ways. And as they go on, as they, as, as they begin to, 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 to learn to walk, as they start to get a bit more confident, some of the, some of the habits and stuff like this are, 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 are losing their power. <coughs> we can step that framework off until in the end, it takes time. They can walk out or just walk away do their own thing. They've got their own place, they've got their own job, they've got their own income, they've got a new set of relationships, new set of skills, ability to cope with life. And through all that, they're walking with Jesus Christ. The main thing underneath everything that we do is spiritual growth. The idea that we're going to have our own relationship with God, our own walk with God. These guys might be walking with the staff at walk, they might be walking with Simon, they might be walking with Wes and people like that. But ultimately, we're walking with God. We're walking with Jesus. And that's what we're doing. And we've got to learn to do that. All of us have to learn to do that for ourselves. With the input of the leaders of the church, with the input of worship leaders, with the input of Bible study and stuff like that, we, we do that, we support one another, but we learn to walk with God for ourselves. And that's the thing. So walk, when we set that up, the purpose is to make disciples. And we want our guys to be disciple makers. We want them to be going out and leading more people to Christ, bringing them to discipleship too, so that they can go out and do the same thing. You know, a lot of the churches in, in the country are, are sort of managing decline. And it, it's kind of depressing when you talk to some church leaders about, they're just conscious that they're losing their influence, that they're losing their numbers. Uh, I was listening to a uh, bishop in the Church of England the other day on the radio, and um, they've got a new plan. And, and on the one hand, they're saying, well, we're going we're gonna to change one of the laws of the church, that you've got to have a... a, a, a a worship service every Sunday in all of these churches across the country. We're going to, we're going to change that. It's not necessary, always. But what we're going to do is we're going to put a congregation in every estate, in every town, every place where there are people, every centre of population is going to have a worshipping community. And they're going to do that. They're going to plant churches in all these estates. Some of them haven't got, haven't got church building. But they've got community centres and places like that. I think it's brilliant. That's fantastic. And the idea is that they're going to be small congregations. And when they get big, they split them, have two. They're not after building big congregations. They just want small churches where people can walk together and disciple one another. 
learn to walk with God. I think that was a really, really exciting thing. So, talk to people as they're coming out of prison, sometimes before they come out of prison, and we say, well, what, what, how would you like your life to be? It's a bit of a stupid question, because very often, I don't really know. I haven't got, I haven't got words for that. So it's a difficult question to answer. How would you love to be? It's very open-ended. But the kind of response that you get back is, I'd like to be a good dad. I want to be a good dad. And that's a very good, a very good answer, really. So, but what, so that's okay. So you, you want to be a good dad. But what sort of things have you got to do? Now, we here as a church, and us down at the Dove, and the churches across this city, have a responsibility. If somebody comes to you and says, I, w- I, I want to be a good dad. I've given my life to the Lord. I want to walk with him. And, and part of that, I want to be a good dad. We need to get beside that person and help them to do that. How do we do that? What sort of things is a person, anyone, going to have to do in order to make that happen? Because that's a big thing actually, particularly if you're talking to a guy who's just coming out of prison. Because very often, their life's chaotic. When they're out of prison, it's just a, a succession of emergencies. It's, it's threats and it's fear and it's dependency on drug or alcohol or possibly unhelpful relationships. All the kind of stuff that drive people. And you can't do anything if that is the quality of your life so you need to break that so you need to break the dependencies the drugs alcohol the unhelpful relationships yeah the person has to learn to trust and this is possibly the biggest thing learn how to trust we all have difficulty with this everybody has difficulty with this this is not a prison thing it's a human thing particularly i think in our in, in, in modern communities You go back a little bit and and people grew up in families. And families were, you know, they were helpful places to grow up because you learn to trust. You have role models. You have male role model, female role model. You've possibly got siblings. You've got extended family. You have relationships. And you learn how to build those relationships. They're healthy relationships. They're, 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 They're positive influences in your life. And you learn how to trust. That's quite an unusual thing now. And, and the emphasis very much for the last 30, 40 years, really, has been on our individual, individuality, being an individual. We have this kind of model of a person standing alone, sort of Clint Eastwood, strong h- hero. And that's not how to be a man. It's not how to be anybody. We, have to, we are almost defined by our relationships. And we need to learn to trust. And trust comes hard to people who are coming out of prison. Possibly every relationship they've ever had has been manipulative. It's got an angle to it. That's another thing, hard thing. It's all part of discipleship. To learn how to build good relationships. And that's before you get on to the secondary stuff. Managing money, having work skills, learning to read and write, all that kind of stuff. Which we might think is perhaps the important thing. You need to come out of prison. I remember talking to someone from the DWP once, worked at the job centre. What, well, you, they need to get a job. Fine, yes, you do need to get a job. But you've never had a job. No one, you've, no one you know has ever had a job. How's that going to work? <laughs> you, don't, you don't know. Uh, yeah, you, you can't just walk out of prison into the job market necessarily. Some people can. Some people can. Not everybody. So the journey we have to take people on. Now, I'm talking about released prisoners because that's my work, really. Uh, has been for a number of years. Um, but this applies to everybody. If we're going to go and bring people to Christ, we have to follow up our evangelism. We have to build life into them. We have to continue that ministry so that that person can stand up and be a discipler themselves it's absolutely great we have to do that and it's something that we're not very good at (coughs) 
So the Gospel of Mark gives us a bit of a snapshot here. I'm just going to put my phone on here because it's got the time on it. So, let's have a look at the beginning of Mark. So the first thing Jesus teaches his disciples is theology. So to, 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 to walk generally, to function in life as a successful human being, you need to have a really strong sense of who you are, a really st- strong sense of who God is. Um, so Jesus doesn't teach theology um, like we might from a thick book by N.T. Wright or John Stott or somebody. That's not how he does it. And he doesn't even give a preview of Romans. You think he might, but he doesn't. <laughs> His teaching is very simple and practical. So, Mark 4, 3 to 9 says this, very familiar words. It says, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across the field, some of the seed fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell in the shallow, shallow soil and the underlying rock. Seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon withered under the hot sun. And since it didn't have any deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among the thorns and grew up choked and produced no grain. Still others fell on fertile soil and they sprouted, grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60 or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone who has ears should listen and understand. Then in verse 10, he says... Later, when Jesus was alone with his 12 disciples and the others who were gathered round, he asked them what the parables meant. And then he unpacks, or they asked him rather, what the parables meant. And he unpacks Isaiah 6 for them. If you've got your spiritual ears plugged in, you'll understand this. If not, it will sound like riddles. Isaiah 6 is is one of the most quoted passages in the New Testament. And it, it goes on about... They'll hear, but they won't understand. They'll see, but they won't perceive. And you think, that's a really negative thing. But that's what Jesus was teaching them. Unless you've got your spiritual ears plugged in, you're not going to hear what he's saying. You're not going to hear what the Holy Spirit says. Paul says in in Corinthians, he says, the things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. And if you're not spiritual, it will sound like nonsense. It will sound like riddles. So Jesus teaches them theology. He teaches them who God is. He teaches them who he is. He teaches them who they are in relation to himself and God. Really, really important that we get that. Jesus includes them in his ministry, demonstrating his authority and also his compassion. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus cast out the legion demon from the man who was chained up by the tombs. The disciples witnessed Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit to the poorest, most helpless, most despised outcast they've ever seen. And they see how he casts out the demons, not with some ritualistic formula, but by talking to them. In fact, he engages in a conversation with them. They're afraid of him. And they don't want him to cast them out into the abyss. He, uh, so he sends them into the swine instead. And it seems like he's almost, almost like a compromise. I mean, the swine died, so I don't know. But um, it's the extraordinary. And so the disciples are there, like f- flies on the wall, watching this take place. And Jesus has his compassion, not for the keepers of the pigs, not for the leaders of the village, but for this man who's the despised outcast. He's chained up by the tombs because nobody could deal with him because he was hard work. Jesus demonstrates his power over nature just before that. In Mark chapter 4, end of Mark chapter 4, Jesus calms a storm. Again, (laughs) it's hands-on ministry. So what you might expect, so Jesus is going to, his disciples are going to watch him calm a storm. So you might expect him, you know, on the, on some headland, some cliff, overlooking this, with the wind coming and blowing his hair and all the rest of it, you know, Charlton Heston. And um, you might expect a sort of thing and he's raising his staff like Moses and calming the storm, you know, like the Red Sea or something like that. But that's not what he does. That's not what he does. They're all in the boat. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. And the storm comes along. And these guys, not all of them, but some of them are professional sailors. Okay? And they're worried because they think they're going to drown. So it was quite serious. 
And Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. Okay? He's a carpenter. What does he know? <laughs> it's a practical training in faith. Okay? So, if you want to see Jesus demonstrating his power over nature, you're in a boat with him in a storm. And you're going to drown. <laughs> so, they wake him up. And it, it seems a little, almost, almost a bit grumpy that he woke him up. <laughs> that they woke him up. <laughs> Have you no faith? <laughs> and he stands up and he calms the storm and then he calms the disciples. He has peace. The peace of God that passes understanding. He has peace. There's no panic with Jesus. The disciples are panicking. And you might think they had reason to panic. They're in an open boat in a storm and it's filling with water and they're going to drown. But there's no panic with Jesus. In one of the Gospels, I think it's Luke, he says, where is your faith? Their faith was asleep in the back of the boat as it happened. Walking with Jesus, there is no panic. Now, Adam walked with God in the Garden of Eden. These disciples are walking with God in the first century Judea. His name is Jesus Christ. We're walking with him in 21st century Staffordshire. Same deal. We can expect an exciting ride. Mark 6, 6 to 9, he sends them out on their own assignment. Okay, you go to Bible college, this will happen. They, 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 they send you out on a bit of a mission trip. So G Jesus sends them out on his own disciples. So uh, Jesus went from village to village teaching the people. And then he called his 12 disciples together and he began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. He delegates his authority to them, just for the period. Now, you have a go. So they've seen him casting out legion from this guy chained up by the tombs. They've seen him raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. They've seen him heal this woman with a flow of blood in the marketplace. They've seen him stand up in a boat in the middle of a storm and calm it. And now he's telling them, you have a go. <laughs> Come on, off, off you trot. <laughs> so a little bit later on in the chapter, they come back together for a debrief. And that turns into the feeding of the 5,000. And so they come to Jesus and they say, all these people, they're hungry. And he says, you feed them. It's practical, hands-on ministry. This is what Jesus means by discipleship. It means he is going to be walking around, he's going to be encountering people, he's going to be healing the sick, he's going to be raising the dead, he's going to be casting out demons, he's going to be calming storms, he's going to be engaging in theological debates with people who shouldn't know what they're talking about. And then he says, you do it. You have a go. One John four seventeen says this: As he is, so are we in this world. Now the disciples were walking with Jesus. Jesus was God. We're not God, but He lives in us. He walks in us. He walks in you, and He walks in me. So when I look in a mirror, I don't see God. Very far from it. But He lives in me, and. He looks into my heart and he wants to see a reflection of himself looking back. This is how disciples are made. If we want to make disciples, a Bible study ain't going to do it. It won't do any harm. It won't do any harm. Yeah, Bible studies are good. I commend you to study the Bible. <laughs> but it ain't enough. There's pr a practical element to this. And this is what we try and do at Walk. 
we try and get beside guys and walk through life with them and teach them spiritual things, but teach them practical stuff too. It's what we do. It's what the church should be doing. Where it's effective is what it does do. And this is what we need to be doing. This is what, we, this is what discipleship is all about. We want to provide assistance. We want to offer a service to people. You know, food banks are great. Unfortunately, they're an essential part of the community at the moment, and it's an essential service that the church provides. But they're very safe ministries. Why? People come to, to food banks as service users, and we are providing a service for them. And they come in, and we give them a service, and they're very grateful and go away again. And it's them and us. That ain't being, that's not making disciples. There's no them and us if we're making disciples. It's us. We're walking with them. Jesus calls his disciples his friends, his brothers. He prays to his father that they, his 12 disciples, would be one as he and his father are one. If you try and get your head around that relationship, that's quite a big one, that is. He identifies with them. We need to sometimes climb down off our high horse and get alongside people. Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's equipping them. He's empowering them. He's enabling them to go away and make disciples. And we've got to do the same thing. <coughs> Wouldn't it be great if, 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 if someone had come to Christ last week, you know, in two years' time, was pastor here? It's going to take a little bit of time. You know, that person has to, has, they've got to learn some stuff. Can't happen tomorrow. It, it can't, genuinely can't happen tomorrow. It, there's a process. There's, the people have to, we're, we're all learning all the time. But how good would that be? Or are we going to be reticent and, and hold them back and say, you can't be in the worship band and, until you've done this course <laughs> or until you've walked here with us here for, for 18 months or something like that. Uh, we can't put barriers in people's way. We can't do it. We have to be empowering them. We have to be enabling them. We have to be walking beside them, encouraging them, teaching them. Now, not everybody can do walk. Walk is a particular thing that we do, and it's a bit full on. But in every community, in every town, in a, pretty much in every village in this country, there is a church, maybe two churches, actually. There's an Anglican church at one end and a Methodist church at the other end. <laughs> one of them's probably a carpet warehouse, actually. But there's a Christian community in every place in this country. It's a wonderful thing. The glory of God. You go around, the most distinctive thing about some of these villages is the church. It's there with a, with a, it's got a spire. It's there to the glory of God. We are here to heal this nation, to be salt and light to it. It's a little picture in Revelation 22. It says this. He showed me a pure a pure river of water of life, clear as, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the streets on either side of the river was the tree of life, and it bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. John 7.38 says this, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The church, from the outset, has taken much of this on board. We, 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 we believe that we're here for our communities. We're here for the nation. We had a prayer meeting last night in Toxeter. We were praying for Parliament. We were praying for our MP. We were praying for the whole kind of Brexit thing. It seems to be deadlocked. It seems to be chaos. But there are Christians in Parliament. 
It's wonderful, actually. Our MP came around to all the local churches a couple of weeks ago, and we thought, well, it's just some constituency thing. I was a little bit um, sceptical about it. He, came around. he wanted to share his testimony. He has come to Christ. He's getting baptised in a couple of weeks. How's that? Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. We should be praying for members of parliament. We should be praying for the government. We need to be praying for them. The church is here to heal this nation. We need to be involved in our communities. We need to be leading men and women to Christ, teaching them how to walk with him. Yeah. I'm going to read a short passage from the book. Then I'm going to quit. Because it's been long enough. This is from page 21. Living in the real world. People come out of prison having difficulties in their lives. It might seem obvious. But it has to be stated in clear. Those of us in the evangelical and charismatic parts of God's kingdom are apt to think, and we often assert, that Jesus is the answer. And by this we seem to mean that if you come to Christ and believe in him for salvation, that that salvation will fix everything. This is an example of magical thinking. We're not sure how it's supposed to work, but we feel that somehow it should. True, Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary cleanses us from sin. If we believe in him, we can stand holy before God, the vilest offender truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. We're saved from God's wrath to share the marvellous inheritance of Christ. Trusting Jesus Christ for salvation removes our guilt and our shame and restores our dignity. The fall in the sense of our isolation from God is reversed. We are saved. We have eternal life. That is brilliant. What salvation doesn't do, at least not immediately, is to remove the consequences of our evil or unwise actions. Consider David and his sin with Bathsheba, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. He committed adultery and murder and lied and manipulated. And confronted with his sin by making the prophet and confessed it and repented before God, Psalm 51. Nevertheless, his actions seriously affected his and many other people's lives. There were far-reaching consequences that he had to live with. <coughs> A person who comes to Christ might have made extraordinary steps in their faith. They might know the Bible well and have identifiable spiritual gifts and find ministry. They might be an able worship leader or a prolific evangelist. They may have led more people to Christ than you have. None of this means that they've addressed the attitudes and behaviours or core problems that took them to prison in the first place. And as we said above, the fact that they've just come out of prison in itself means that they're facing challenges. Some of those challenges will be basic, to do with self-care and coping with life. Some will be more specialised, such as drug dependency or mental illness. Or there may be issues connected with offending behaviour or a risk to that the person poses <coughs> to particular groups of people. In order to provide effective support to police prisoners, you have to be able and prepared to engage with these things, to admit that a person finds it hard to control their moods, or to get ahead of their long-term drug habit, is not to doubt their faith. Or to impugn the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice, it's just being realistic. The Bible tells us that fervent love will cover a multitude of sins, but that doesn't mean that anything about that love being blind. On the other hand, we shrink back in fear and hold our guests at arm's length and seek to put them in a safeguarding box. We won't be shut up at all. We'll leave them more hurt and alienated than they were to start with. We must love wisely. Churches typically fall into two equal and opposite errors when confronted with previous prisoners. In hearing that a new, offender, uh, a new attender is an ex-offender on release, they might be inclined to hit the big red panic button and reach for the safeguarding manual, <laughs> leaving an ex-offender feeling even more isolated and stigmatised. The response, a response motivated by fear. Alternatively, they might make them into some kind of celebrity. Smothering them in love and attention and, giving, and having them share their faith stories in the morning service. This is dangerous. It leaves the released prisoner disorientated because trust is something they find hard. And soon they're going to be let down again. The church can't deliver on the promises it seems to be making. It's also dangerous because you really don't know who this person is and what they might do. What happens when they relapse into their heroin habit? 
This should be a middle way, a way motivated by the gospel of Christ, but also informed by an understanding of what pressures these prisoners might face and how to provide support for them, and that understands that this is not someone else's problem. Books available. I've got some copies there. Um, which please come and buy. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, you can buy it at Eden, or you can order it from the bookshop if you want. Um, and I do recommend it to you. I think that, so, you know, there are churches, as, as I said before, in every community. In the I think very, very few churches haven't been affected by prison. Somebody, somewhere, a, a relative or a friend or family member has been in prison or has offended in some way. And they'll be facing problems and difficulties because of that. And so, even if you're not involved in something like war, there's some useful advice and guidance. Thanks very much. Thank you.